Right, greetings. Hello. It's um, Dr. Thomas Daffin again, back for the Philosophy Club here in, in uh, little um, La Creuse, the most amazing department in the geographical centre of France, where all the Druids of old are now being reborn and doing wonderful work. Um, and it's where I hold this, this um, Philosophy Club on Sunday evenings, so welcome. Um, and as usual, I'm going to start with just a few books from my huge library, just to sort of share ideas. If you're interested in this research, then, you know, beg, borrow or steal these, these books. These will be useful. Firstly, this is a very important encyclopedia of philosophy. It's, um, it's seven volumes. Um, it was published some time ago, edited by Paul Edwards, um, Macmillan Publishers. It's, um, well, each volume is like 500 pages or something. And it's, it's obviously an A to Z of every single philosopher, pretty much, who's ever lived. So everyone that's on the periodic table. It was co-written by many academics. Um, and it's one of the most reliable, solid, um, you know, the list of contributors is enormous. Um, and I've used this during my entire teaching career as a kind of go-to reference book. I have to give a lecture on Kant or Hegel or Plato or whatever. But it also has, you know, more obscure ones, like the very first entry is Nicola Abagnano, born in 1901 at Salerno, the chief exponent of Italian existentialism, which is one of the boxes in the philosophy columns. Well, you know, not that many people have heard of dear old Nicola, but bless him, he was a great writer. And philosopher. So, anyway, that's that's really a to die for um, thing. That if you're, you know, find a good second-hand bookshop, you can get that. This is a University of Oxford publication, Dictionary of Buddhism, written by a colleague of mine, Damien Cowan, who um, I don't know if he's still there, but he was reader in Buddhism at Goldsmiths College at the University of London, uh, where I did my PhD and taught for many years. Um, <clears throat> I think I met him once, we did a conference on Buddhism at SOAS, and he was one of the speakers. I talked about enlightenment in Buddhism. Um, and it's brilliant, it's sort of A to Z, every little detail about Buddhism, Buddhist sages, teachers, different Zen masters, lineages, um, and the sacred texts, which sutras, and so on and so on. He's, he's a great scholar, as old Damien. Hope he's still going. <coughs> He's a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society, so, um, you know, good luck to him. It's a great book if you're into Oriental thought. And finally, I want to share one of my most precious books, the Oxford Classical Dictionary. I have two editions of this because it is updated every 10 or 20 years. This is the edition that was um, first published in 1949. Oxford Classical Dictionary. Um, you know, I love these old Oxford University publications, and they have this, this sort of charter on, which is the crest of the University of Oxford, which says in Latin, um, God, illuminate me, um, which is the motto of the University of Oxford, which is a brilliant saying. It's what, you know, we should all um, pray for. As teachers um, or philosophers, you know, wisdom is, is bigger than any one of us. We're all just little bits on the table. And therefore we should all pray to God, which is the word for the absolute in Anglo-Saxon, to illuminate us, which is send us the light of wisdom. Anyway, this is amazing. Um, it's got a more recent edition, which I also have. Um, <clears throat> and then there's even a more recent edition, which I don't yet have, because these are expensive books. And, um, but it's got entries on every, every classical philosopher in depth, you know, and the context of their times, what they wrote. But it's also got really interesting things like, like the scrolls they used. What were they made of? What kind of pens did they use? What were the libraries like? Who, who organised the curriculum in ancient Greece and Rome? Um, you know, etc., etc. And it's got an entry on the Delphic Games, which was a great gathering of intellectuals and artists and poets in Greece. Um, 
and Rome. It lasted for a thousand years, and I'm the educational director. We're trying to rebirth it. It's got a lovely entry on the Delphic Oracle, um, which and, and all the different oracles of the ancient world, where prophetes, they, that's the origin of the word prophet, prophetes would go and receive a download from the divine intelligence. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's an amazing study, and well done, Oxford, and keep it up. Classics are essential if you're going to study philosophy, really. And then the final book I want to share is is the library catalogue of this library here, the Ipskip Library Catalogue. It's been published, it, you can get it, you know, it's available. Um, and each of the rooms of the library are divided into the nine muses. So you've got all the books to do with conflict and law in Melpomene upstairs. And it tells you here the lists of what's in that library room. Then Polyhymnia has got the lists of all the books in the religious studies room. Um, and Thalia, the literature room, which is on the top floor. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a catalogue, and if you're curious and you can't come and visit me in person, you can get the catalogue and see what we've got here. Um, Irato is the room of philosophy, but it's also the room of love, because philosophy means the love of wisdom. And so it's also got the books about sexuality and the Tower of Women and the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets and... Sex in Elizabethan England by Alan Haynes and the goals of human sexuality and so on and so on. You know, it's, it's got all kinds of secrets as well as it's the room of psychology. So it has the works of Freud and Jung and transpersonal psychologists and they're all listed here in the catalogue. So, um, <clears throat> you know, have a, have a browse at it. Um, yes. Right, so I just wanted to start with those, that little introduction. And I'm going to start by ringing the bell today for the, for the class, because the bell is to summon the Dakinis of wisdom, who are like the muses, but in Buddhism. We have the goddess here, here visiting. This is a statue from ancient Greece. Um, but the Dakinis were the Buddhist equivalent. And they were thought of as like muses that inspire the sages. And you can't become an enlightened Buddha unless you have good friendships with the Dakinis or the Dakas, which is the male equivalent. And they were supernatural divine beings that come and inspire one. And I've discovered just this month, there's a thing called Happy Dakini Day. Every month in the Tibetan Buddhist calendar, when all these Happy Dakinis come and bless a teaching center like this. So Happy Dakini Day this month is on the 13th of June. And in Buddhist temples around the world, of the Vajrayana variety, they celebrate Happy Dakini Day, which I think is a lovely custom. After that, it's July the 12th. <coughs> and so on. So you can just, like, Google Happy Dakini Day and it comes up. Right, there we are. So, look, let's do the bell and then we'll go to our first pair. This is a Tibetan bell designed for summoning bikinis and other enlightened teachers. Right, okay, go for it. Okie dokie. Um, today, tell me something between Primal Besk number 11, box, green box. And have we done yet uh, Dingo, Dingambara 88? I don't think so, but anyway, we can redo it. Um. Hmm. Great. Jane, that's a Jane one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go and get a reference book to, to do justice to this. Now, right, 
right. Um, <clears throat> so this is the kind of reference book that goes with the table. And um, I just want to share some of the names for God in Basque because they're unusual and it's a complex ancient religion. Um, and I don't carry that level of detail in my mind all the time, sadly. Um, so <clears throat> let's start with the Basque religion. So the, the Basque or Vascon, as they're called in French, um, live in the far southwest of France and the north uh, west, I suppose, of Spain, no, northeast of Spain, isn't it? Um, around the Pyrenees Mountains. So you have Basques living both in France and also in Spain. And they speak this ancient language called Basque, which is, they call it <coughs> um, Wiscala. And it, it is not known what, where it comes from, this language. It's, it's not Indo-European. It doesn't seem to be related to Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, all the Indo-European languages, or English. It's, it's more old. It's more ancient. And I think the consensus is that these people are speaking the language that was there in the Magdalenian culture, 10,000, 15,000 BC, in the Dordogne, in the, um, in the caves of Lascaux and so on. It's a relic from ancient, ancient Europe. Um, and I once went to the Basque country, and of course I bought a dictionary, I've got a two-volume dictionary upstairs, of Basque words, um, which went into my dictionary of philosophy and stuff. And <clears throat> their name for um, a sage is a um, Sorginak, which is also a pagan witch and a priestess. The Basque religion started as a pagan religion, which is why it's, it's numbered in the, in the green ones, the earliest primal religions. We know about it because it lived on in Basque folklore and legend. So, so they have names for the different gods and goddesses of the air, the sun, the moon, the sky, the wind, and the sea. The sea is quite important in Basque religion. Um, <clears throat> Sadly, in the 1500s, 1600s, um, the Christians got very active in persecuting Basque pagans, and they accused them of witchcraft, and they burned quite a lot of them. Um, but the only good thing that can be said is we have the Inquisition records, therefore, preserved in archives, and you know these guys were tortured as to what they believed, and so we know some of from that. Um, their goddess of thunder and rain was called Mari. She's the goddess. She lives in the mountains, and she's the mistress of sorcerers and seers and prophets. It's, today we had a bit of a visit from Mari because it thundered a bit here in, in uh, La Creuse. So if I was a Basque sage, I'd say, oh, Mari's up. Mar Mari's doing her thing. Um, she has a consort who's Maju who's the god of thunder and hailstorms and lightning. And that happens when he meets up with Mari in the sky and they have a sort of wonderful lovey-dovey experience and then it lightnings and everything crashes. And so the sage would say, oh yeah, the god and the goddess are up to their stuff. So they, they projected these, obviously the, the human energy of love and, and sexuality onto these divine beings sky beings in this case. Um, there's also a, a, another god who's a kind of green man figure called Basajuan. And the green man is slightly playful. He likes um, being in the woods, dressing up. He's the archetype that is at the root of Robin Hood and, and the merry men in the forest who wear green. And the green man, there's a green man festival in Clun, where I used to live in, in Shropshire on the edge with the Welsh marchers. And so the green man is, is playful and he's there to remind us we, we should enjoy life, to celebrate. Um, there's also um, Lamiak, who is a female nature deity. So she's like the green woman, if you want, and the goddess of the plants and everything. There's Elagia, who is a moon goddess. Now, Elagia is very interesting because the ancient pagan people really loved the moon. You could define paganism as moon worship, almost. 
although they also worship the sun, but they especially love the moon. Because um, the sun can be a bit too hot, you know, it's like too much in your face sometimes. And uh, it was the moon that they really worship, because you can come out at night and it's still beautiful and light. It's been full moon the last couple of days here in La Creuse. Now I've discovered something recently, well I sort of knew it vaguely, but now I know it, I think for sure, um, how the moon was formed. Now I don't think the Basque um, primal religions necessarily knew this, but they intuited it was very important, as do the Wiccans and Druids in the Celtic world and Anglo-Saxon world. What it seems now, and I've been watching and learning this from a BBC documentary called The Universe, which has just come out, and it has amazing commentary by Morgan Freeman, the actor who tends to play God. Um, so it's like God giving an overview of the entire universe, where it began, how it was formed, how, wh what atoms are, what is photons, what, what, you know, and how did the Earth get formed? So according to Morgan Freeman, and he is an authority being God, um, our planet, Earth, and the other planets, we formed from a, a dust cloud around the sun. And the thing about this documentary is it shows it in, in like Technicolor and 3D and everything. It's amazing computer graphics. Right? And <clears throat> in the early days of the Earth, after it had, not long after it had been formed, we were hit by another planet, which has been called um, Thea, which means the goddess. Right? So the goddess, Thea, crashed into baby Gaia, Earth, and... <coughs> They actually merged, because they were both semi-molten still. They blended and merged and became one. So we have on this earth the body of that, that goddess planet. But a whole bunch of it was blown off into the sky, and that became the moon. So the moon is, uh, I'm not sure if it was parts of Thea or parts of Terra that was blown off and became the satellite. Um, I don't know if they know. But the point is, as the documentary explains, it's because of that unique moon that we have seasons. And also it's because Thea hit the Earth, it tilted us off our true north axis by 23 degrees, I think. And that creates the seasons as we, as we rotate around. So sometimes we're nearer to the sun, sometimes further away. That's winter and summer. And this itself made life possible. Because life is needed, those seasons. And it's explained in the documentary. So planets which don't have this tilt, like Mercury and Venus, they don't have life. Um, and Mars. So actually, we owe life, I owe my being here, to the moon, Elagia. So why shouldn't we worship the moon goddess, you know, given her importance? Um, so there we are. Maybe the Basques sort of had an intuitive memory. And if they are the descendants of the cave-dwelling peoples of, of ancient Europe um, in that part of the world, we know, that according to Alexander Marshak, a scholar, that they used to notch the moon calendar on bone. It's the first sort of writing symbolic mathematics that humans have ever done from that same time period. So they were really tuned to the moon. So Elagia is very important. And then we also have Otzi, who's the sun god. Well, you know, we wouldn't exist without the sun. And although he's a bit full of himself, we love him. And without him, there'd be no food, there'd be no plants, there'd be no daylight, there'd be no life, there'd be no photosynthesis. And there'd be no, um, you know, I mean, the most there'd be is a few like little microbes living in the deep sea around uh, vents that, that pipe up, you know, hot lava and stuff, but that's not life. Well, it's, it's living, but it's not intelligent life. So we owe that to the sun god. Um, and then lastly, there's another uh, god called Sugar, who is a dragon consort of Mari. Another, another consort. So Mari, who's the goddess of thunder and rain, she has, um, she has both, you know, Maju, but also she has this dragon consort, so that must be her lover that visits her from time to time. So like all powerful women, she's allowed more than one lover. Which is interesting because it sort of points back to a time of matriarchy, when, when women could, could do that, and that was official. Um, so, 
you know, that's just a little glimpse of their, their theology, if you want, or theology, which is the word for a theology of goddess worshippers. Um, they, their, you know, their sacred places are the Basque mountain range, Cantabrian range, the Pyrenees, also the rivers that flow there, the sea. Um, each family home was sacred, they would have an altar. Um, Basque Settlements included what's now Santander, Bilbao, Guernica, and Biarritz. All these ancient cities in Spain and France are Basque in origin. And, and also the Paleolithic caves of that region, including the Altamira cave. And these have some of the earliest cave paintings of history. And I, I, I maintain that also the Lascaux people and further north in the Dordogne were Basque speakers. Um, what are their key ideas? Well, fertility, the powers of nature. Divinity can take both male and female forms. Magical powers can be accessed by us humans to be used correctly. Oaths are sacred. And you, I mean, the sacred oak at Guernica is where the parliament used to meet. You would swear an oath before the, the oak to tell the truth and be a righteous person. Um... You know, so what's not to love, really? These, these Basques are amazing, and um, <clears throat> they've given us some many famous people over the centuries. They became Christian, and largely the Basque religion became Christian, but, but they've never lost their deep reverence for nature and the wisdom of magical places and so on. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there are scholars in the Basque world <clears throat> working on peace and on spirituality and so on, like me. Um, so, we love you, and, and there are lots of books you can get of mythology and legends from the Basque religion. Um, and there's probably a few people who've done like a revival of Basque paganism, like the Druids have for the Celtic world. But I don't, I'm not in direct contact with any of them, but I'm sure there are around. Um, <clears throat> okay, so how does that relate to the, the Digambara traditions? <clears throat> so the Digambara are a school of Jainism, which is one of the oldest religions of ancient India. And it, it has these periodic wisdom teachers that come and that teach nonviolence <clears throat> and enlightenment. It's number 88 in the periodic table. Um, and really one needs this this guidebook has a code for it. Um, <clears throat> so, many great Jain saints have been from this oldest form of uh, Jainism, founded by Mahavira, um, who lived around about the same time as Buddha. Um, what's important about them is that they're very pure, and they believe that wearing clothes is an unnecessary thing. They live in a very hot part of the world, southern India, a lot of them. So they just go naked, um, like wandering sadhus, um, because clothes are a distraction and you have to clean them and buy them. And These people try and live off-grid. Right? This is the ultimate off-grid thing, is getting rid of the clothes. Um, if you become enlightened, and their goal is to spend a lot of the day in meditation, when they're tuning their mind into the airwaves of divine intelligence. So they <clears throat> tune in, they become what's called Kivalin. Um, Kaivalya Jnana is their name for absolute consciousness. And we're all capable of it, but we tend to fill our lives with distractions, like all kind of stuff we do. Whereas they focus purely on being, being that enlightened mind. Um, they've written many holy scriptures. Um, Kuma da Chandra was one of their great saints, and there are many others. Um, they say of the gods, they would say, if you, met, if you got a Basque sage to meet with the Dikambara Jain, they'd have a great old conversation. The Basque guy would say, well, I love nature, I worship the sun and the moon, the nature gods and stuff. The Basque would say, okay, that's all very well, but like that's just temporary because this planet is only temporary. Um, 
you know, um, what you should worship is the divine intelligence that your mind is capable of. Because of all beings, we humans have got this faculty to tune into absolute gnosis. And you should cultivate that whilst you can and not go charging after the sort of the deities that they can put on a good show, thunder and lightning and all that. But they're not going to get you to enlightenment. <clears throat> so they'd have a very interesting conversation. Um, the Jains believe that um, the, per the ultimate purpose of human life is to achieve that enlightenment, that, in that all encompassing gnosis, which sees everything from all possible angles. Um, Jainism says that the absolute truth, like if you ask me, and I'm a Jain sage, and you say, how many gods and goddesses are there? You know, have you counted them up? Like, I've got several directories here in the library, which I've got one which is about 600 pages. There's about 10,000 god names in there from all the tribes of humanity. But of course, that's just on the one planet. So there must be intelligent beings on other planets. The Jains would agree. So we could do a sort of mathematical calculation, and I've done it in my book on religious mathematics. Like, roughly, if the universe is this big and has this many galaxies, and each galaxy has this many of stars which have got habitable planets, and each planet has roughly this many gods, you know, what would be the total number? And it comes out something ridiculous, right? You know, trillions and quadrillions. Um, but of course the James would say, yeah, but you can't know that for sure. I mean, we don't know for sure the universe ends anywhere. I mean, it could be just our telescopes haven't seen the next big bit. And it's interesting in the Hubble telescope, um, the placement, this this um, this new telescope has gone up. They found even bigger, like galaxies beyond what they thought was the edge of the universe. Whole whole universes they found using this um, this new telescope. So the James would say, yeah, it's going to keep going. You know, for all they we know, we're just one like tiny tiny particle in an ever expanding. You know, and the James would say, yeah. So. The thing is to, to, to become as wise as you can in this incarnation, because they believe in incarnation, reincarnation. I think the Basques do too. Um, spirit is alone, eternal. Nonviolence, ahimsa, is an absolute precondition of moksha or liberation. <clears throat> this, the, the Jains say you cannot commit violence and then achieve liberation, because in killing something of value and beauty, you're bringing that negative karma onto yourself. So this inspired um, Gandhi and um, it probably also inspired Buddha. I mean, I, I'd love to write a little play about when Buddha and Mahavira met. And I think they inspired each other. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite an important tradition. Um, they're a bit strict, though, and there's one thing I wouldn't agree with them, which is they say that women can't achieve enlightenment until they're reborn as men. They can't achieve final enlightenment because they're not, they don't like to become naked. You know, so I don't think the Digambara women go around naked. Um, they're mostly lay followers. I, I Personally, I find that a slight problem, and I think I'd give a mark to the Basque guy at this point who would say, no, no, our, our women prophetesses, uh, priestesses are just as important as our male ones, whether they're wearing clothes or not, you know. That's a silly criteria. Um, other Jains, the most, most Jains I've met have been the Svetambara kind, who wear white, and I've met lots of them. And they're more um, relaxed about this, and they certainly think women can achieve enlightenment. I've met some pretty enlightened Jain nuns, I tell you, who are also mathematicians. So... I, I would say that maybe the Digambaras represent a sort of old-fashioned patriarchal kind of view. Um, but, you know, um, uh, each to their own. And, um, but I think, I think, you know, that, that's a slight down mark, I would say. Um, <clears throat> they also say that the oldest scriptures have been lost. The Jain scriptures, which were passed down orally initially, have been lost. Um, but they do have their own sacred sacred books. Um, so anyway, may enlightenment come upon them. And um, there's a lot, you know, it would be interesting to organise a, a philosophical debate between a Basque pagan woman and a Jain Digambara 
sage. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Next one. Okie dokie. Let me just add, like, whilst you're looking, yes. one little footnote, which is the other thing the Basque might say to the Jain is, because the Jains believe in absolute total non-violence, so you have to wear a mask, you can't breathe an insect, you can't squash a fly, and even if a scorpion's about to sting your baby, you can't, like, tread on it. Um, it's sort of fanatical absolute non-violence. What the Basque guy might say, or the woman would say, that's taking it a bit far, because... Violence itself is sort of part of nature. Inside me, as I'm talking, millions of cells are dying, but millions of other ones are being reborn. In my neurons, you know, cells die off and they get reborn all the time in the blood and so on. In a woman, when she ovulates, she gives birth, no, not fertilised, so the egg dies and gets flushed away. So death seems to be part of life. Um, and I had this conversation with Acharya Tulsi, a great Svetambara Jane, saying surely this absolute non-violence is almost like anti-life because the only way we can be absolutely non-violent in that sense is to be disembodied spirits with no bodies um, because by being embodied we're, we're constantly in this life-death cycle so my argument or the Basque sage would want to say um, a little bit of violence keeps the thing turning round just like death, I will die one day, everyone does. I don't regret that. All I want is a nice long life so I can finish all my books and do my teachings. And I want that for everybody. What I'm against, and what the Basques are against, is premature enforced death, which is violence. Um, when you know I go and kill somebody because they're a Ukrainian or the wrong kind of Yemeni or whatever. So I think there's a middle way between the absolute non-violence of the Jains and the sort of common sense of peace maximize the peace <clears throat> but don't but also realize that death is part of the life cycle and most animals and plants they they ingest other animals for their own life and i don't think you know if you can think of a better way of organizing life then please let me know but i think that death is part of god's magical process of of lifing and that is symbolised in the Christian Mass, you know, the body and blood of Christ, or Dionysus, becomes the, 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 the nourishment for the believer. Um, so even out of Christ's death, sacrificial death, comes life. And <clears throat> in the pagan world, we accept death in the Druid world, in the Wiccan and other pagan religions. Um, so I just think the Jains, I love them, but they might want to re-examine that particular concept of absolute non-violence and see if it's not hampering some kind of <clears throat> some kind of common sense knowledge actually about how to live um, anyway just a few controversial thoughts there right have you got the next two 41 41 <clears throat> voila 41 where is it oh it's pink oh moism okay right and yeah. philosophy, 128. 128. Oh, well, we had that. We had that previous time. Miscellaneous. We had. We had oh, I thought it was that. over here. Missing from 100. Mm. 100 to, um, all right, the other one. Yeah. Um, what could be? Ah, can I choose another primal one? Sure. Uh, boom. Ah. 90. Okay. Um, 